civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had been arrested in Georgia for violating probation that stemmed from a simple traffic citation. The severity of his sentence, four months hard labor, aroused fears that he would be murdered in prison and set off an international outcry for his release. An appeal for help went out to the presidential candidates, yet both hesitated to intervene, gauging the political risk as too great. The Voting Rights Act was still five years away, and few blacks were allowed to vote in the segregated South. The candidates feared that a show of support for Dr. King would antagonize Southern white voters who were crucial to victory. Shriver felt his party should reach out to King. Shriver, as head of the Civil Rights Division, was tasked with trying to get out the black vote. This was important to him simply because, you know, as, as an electoral concern. But that's not what really drove him. What drove him was this underlying concern with achieving racial and social justice and eradicating what he felt was the, the sin of racism. Both Nixon and uh, Kennedy had, had a, a golden opportunity here to do something. Neither one had, and Shriver really wanted Kennedy to take uh, a stronger stand on, on civil rights. Shriver had worked with Dr. King on civil rights issues and was keenly aware of the brutality of white supremacy, especially in the South. As he sped to reach his brother-in-law, Shriver thought of Dr. King's wife, the terror she'd feel, not knowing what might happen to her husband in a rural Georgia prison. They came to the cell and they shined the light in his face and he said, King, get up, put on your clothes. And he didn't know where he was going. They handcuffed him and put chains around his legs and put a big dog with him and put him in the back of the car. And he had to ride that way for three, over 300 miles. Then he asked where he was going. They refused to talk to him. For all he knew, they were taking him out someplace to lynch him. When Shriver arrived at Kennedy's motel, he waited for campaign aides to leave. He didn't want a committee meeting to decide whether Kennedy should take the political risk of helping Mrs. King. So it was Shriver in a hotel room at O'Hare Airport in Chicago that said to John F. Kennedy, we need to do this because it's the right thing to do. Shriver told Kennedy, Negroes don't believe everything will change tomorrow, no matter who's elected. But they want to know whether you care. Shriver almost offhandedly convinced Kennedy that in fact he needed to do this. And so Shriver dialed Coretta Scott King's number in the hotel room as Kennedy was packing his bag to go somewhere else on the campaign trail and uh, handed the receiver to John F. Kennedy. He said, This is Senator Kennedy. I'm, I'm calling because I'm concerned about you and your husband. And if there's anything that I can do to be helpful, I mean, please feel free to call on me. And I said, I'm sure there's something that you can do, so whatever you can do, I would appreciate it. The next day, an article about the call appeared in the New York Times. Bobby Kennedy, the candidate's brother and campaign manager, was furious. Well, as soon as Bobby heard, he called and said, you bomb throwers, and you tell Sergeant Shriver this, that you're, you're closed down. Your civil rights section has probably lost the election. Three Southern governors had said that if we supported Castro, Khrushchev, or Martin Luther King, we'll support Nixon. And you tell Sergeant Shriver that just get out of the way. I mean, it was, he was lividly, coldly angry. Shriver recalled, Bobby landed on me like a ton of bricks. But now that the call was public, Bobby Kennedy leaned hard on the sentencing judge. Dr. King was released. With the election just days away, campaign aides were making dire predictions about how many Southern white votes Kennedy would lose. But in Atlanta, another plot line was unfolding. Civil rights leaders were saying, it's time to take off our Nixon buttons. In the aftermath, the leaders of the civil rights movement became notified that Kennedy had placed this call. It was especially significant to Martin Luther King's father, who was a tremendously prominent pastor in Atlanta. 
And he said if he had the courage to wipe the tears from my daughter-in-law's eyes in that telephone call, I'll take my suitcase full of votes up to give them to Senator Kennedy. I have a sack full of votes, and I think I'm going to take them up to Washington and put them at the feet of John F. Kennedy. Very close throughout the evening. Kennedy well ahead. The odds have now shifted in favor of Vice President Nixon. Kennedy's, Kennedy's lead down. The election was decided by one of the smallest margins in history. The closest election of this generation. Prior to 1960, large numbers of black voters, including Martin Luther King Jr., voted Republican. But now, a record black voter turnout for Kennedy made him a winner in five northern states he otherwise would have lost. Nixon wrote that it was one of the key reasons Kennedy won. A new era in American politics was beginning. It's clear that one of the things that happened when Kennedy called King was to make a gesture of compassion to an African-American man from a white leader. This gesture resonates so powerfully precisely because it's the affirmation of a much larger principle and the principle that animates a struggle for millions of people at this point in the United States. And in many ways, this is a signature of the ways in which Shriver understood the need for people in public service and in positions of public power to be motivated by something other than simply the exercise of that power for its own sake.